Huh. So that's what they meant by doomsday. This isn't part of the Doing History series, so there's not a normal starting question. Instead, we'll be taking the opportunity afforded to me by being given a CD key to talk about the nature of narrative in strategy games. Consider this disclosure, but ideally don't write me off over it. Stellaris is a game by Paradox Interactive, set in space. That's it. I'll ramble about this later, but technically it's not a game about the future. The premise is space exploration, clashing empires, conquest, and acquisition of star systems, arguably in that order. For those who haven't played Stellaris before, here's a really short overview. It's a semi-symmetrical space exploration empire game driven by war and diplomacy, like many games in the genre, but it deviates in that it's got a substantial focus on customization, exploration, and events. A strength of this is that the game doesn't lack for gameplay just because you're going tall or peaceful. It also gives the player something they can choose to be more active in while the timers tick, where in something like EU4, you're more or less just waiting for the next war. The game emphasizes narrative over efficiency and skill gameplay. And as for defining narrative, we'll hold off for just a second because we need to talk about DLC. Like in other Paradox games, core mechanics are sometimes bundled with DLCs that add flavor. But there's something different here, and it has everything to do with the structure of the game and narrative. Stellaris and its DLC focus more on providing tools to make up a setting and narrative than they do on fleshing out a segment of history. In fact, there's no history here to flesh out. In turn, there's not that issue that the history games have where you go, oh, well, I have no interest in playing Iberia ever, but I do want pirates. Guess I gotta buy this DLC. This difference may just be semantic or psychological, but the DLCs have generally impacted or benefited every playthrough I've done. Now, I can't exactly speak to how unplayable the game gets if you're on the latest patch and you don't have the DLC, because I keep my game's version rolled back to whatever the latest DLC I own is. That's a tip from me to you if you're not in the mood for keeping up with things. In fact, it's why my EU4 may never leave 1.31. That's not to say that all the DLC is in some way deeply integrated and integral. There are species packs which are fairly similar to flavor packs in other games. They add a new set of portraits to the list, and the different species sometimes has some different way of playing the game, which can range from mildly to deeply impactful on playstyle, but also relatively isolated in their changes. You won't be playing as a bunch of space foxes and audibly lamenting that you don't have the rock people pack, you know? Stellaris almost feels more like guided creative writing than it does a map game. If anything, I think the story elements manage to hit a good balance of detailed and vague, where they don't feel full on like a Mad Lib you're just filling in the keywords for, but they do have some guidance. Far more than any other 4X game I've played, Stellaris is about exploration, and it keeps that element of its design active for far longer than most games. On a first playthrough of Civ, you have some sense of what the world will be like. Everything is based on reality. Stellaris isn't. You don't know what you'll find out there. A weird giant shield sphere encasing an inhabited planet, a destroyed ring world, Earth but post-apocalypse, and you also don't know who you'll meet. Or maybe you do. More on that later. Civilization has exploration for the sake of finding ideal setups, good places for cities, natural wonders, and learning who else is in the game. It doesn't take long to find your ideal city placement and meet your neighbors. You'll usually have mapped out your whole landmass well, well before you can leave to another one. Stellaris goes beyond that. The game is set in a truly alien universe, and exploration doesn't vanish as a gameplay element and isn't limited to just physical exploration. Imagine if the tribal villages in Civ required some manner of discovery, existed on every other tile, and had event chains. So now that we've talked a bit about what drives Stellaris, how DLC fits in, and noted that it's a narrative-driven game, let's step back and look at the broader genre and what narrative means within and beyond history as far as games are concerned. 
One of the latter themes of my series on doing history was that many theories and approaches to history require some degree of narrativization in order to function. History can be scientific in the way we approach it, but it hardly is in the way we talk about it. Despite how EU4 is basically a spreadsheet with graphics, history, as an academic discipline, is not. First off, the graphics are terrible, and second, we discuss the events of history not as data points, but as causes, effects, consequences, experiences, stuff like that. Now, that doesn't mean history is the realm of storytellers in the end, nor should it be. It means that our means of communicating and understanding history often rely on narrative frameworks. Even if there isn't a one true narrative, either because there's never been one, or we lost the thread, or because we've become aware of conflicting narratives and thus differ ends, we would still have to speak of events. This happened, and then this happened. Julius Caesar was stabbed, Rome became an empire, France became a republic, Ireland became independent. Each of these things has a story. We don't refer to the Irish famine as the 1845 population decline as though it's just a data point. All of that to say that history and narrative are linked concepts, as are narratives and games. Games have a certain framework for how they construct historical narratives, indeed ranging from guided, as with Paradox's historical strategy games, or a more toolbox approach, as with the Civilization games. Stellaris is… different. Stellaris takes the formula crafted in the historical genre and imparts it onto a fantasy one. Or, well, a future one? Calling it sci-fi feels like it could either be totally fine or could start a blood feud the same way calling Dune sci-fi does. Uh, I'll say this. Stellaris is a game which explores the creation of narratives which center on an imagined intergalactic future. But even then, there are some contentions to be had. Humans do not even need to be in this future. It's not our future, and in theory, could even be our past. Sorry, I know this is getting pretty semantic as well. It's space exploration and deals with technology and empires we, of our present world, would consider future slash advanced technology. So I'll call it futuristic, even if Earth can be found in game and only be as far as the Middle Ages. Earlier I called Civ a toolbox, and I think that's an appropriate label to extend to Stellaris, but for a different reason. Rather than give us the trappings of history in an incredibly loose historical setting, we are given the blank slate of an imagined future and a toolbox, not of the real, of the past, but filled with imaginary inventions, advancements, and technologies in a world where exploration is one of the most meaningful methods of interaction. The game is entirely detached from history and the present. It plays as a sandbox that gives you more than just a shovel and a bucket. It gives you new sand. And one of those tools used to shape that sand is the Empire Creator. Now, there's a small tangent to be had here about other games. Yes, technically you could rename your Civ in Civ and pick a custom religion, and yes, in EU4 you could slap your custom nation on the map, or in CK3 create a custom ruler, title, faith, etc. There are avenues for players to deviate from a historical toolbox, but at the least, speaking for myself, unless those things are worked for in the same way changing the course of history normally is, i.e. rewards for play, as in CK, they feel a bit weak. Custom nations were, in EU4, something I assumed I wanted far, far more than I actually did. I think I've maybe used them 10 times across almost 2,000 hours of play. The custom nation feels like it doesn't belong, no matter how much you try and flesh it out or justify it. You've messed with the point of departure for the alternate history game. Stellaris does not have this problem. Because it's a game populated by aliens with all kinds of traits, nothing stands out as unreal. Uh, well, maybe the Romans. Honestly, I'm more surprised Paradox didn't go for Byzantine representation instead, given how they've been present in every single game since Victoria 2. In Stellaris, you create the empires you'll play as. There are a few presets, but I imagine most people prefer to make their own combinations. I would also imagine they do so less for the sake of min-maxing and more for the sake of creating the basis of a narrative. Also, any empires you make can be allowed, or even forced, to feature in other playthroughs. 
I've even made a few that aren't interesting to me in terms of playstyle, but simply populate my roster. Empires I would find interesting to meet rather than play. This is what I meant when I said maybe you'll know who you might meet. Empires are made distinct by the different traits one can give them, ranging from homeworld types and habitability preference, to government and civics, to species portrait and biological traits of their species, and arguably, most importantly, to origins. And so we come to Stellaris Overlord. Overlord is the perfect DLC to discuss origins and the general narrativization of Stellaris with. It's something beyond a flavor pack, but it's not something that adds such a crucial mechanic that one might feel the need to get it just for the integrated features alone. As I mentioned before, the structure of the game leaves DLC in a more generally integrated space. Stellaris Overlord has a few features that flesh out the relationship between what else, an overlord, and subjects. More interesting to me and our discussion, though, is the opportunity it gives us to talk about origins in Stellaris. Origins are one of the more clever and intuitive ways to hand the player new tools for creating narratives. Where a game like EU4 starts with a static world, Stellaris can't do that. So how do you make your empire feel grounded and worth narrative and emotional investment? You can't go the Civ route using history to imagine one's people. There's no history of this galaxy, and when Civ tried to do something like this with Beyond Earth, it fell supremely flat. Reading the backstory of some loose cultural conglomerate isn't as interesting as working with a blank slate. With Stellaris, there's the aforementioned general traits, and there's origins. Origins do a lot to set one's empire apart from the next and add flavor to the game. They can do just as much to shape an empire's path through tech as ethics do, but they're unchanging where ethics can occasionally slide around. And they're a bit more specific than loose ethos like egalitarian or a trait like strong. Origins have more narrative influence, but they don't end up too restrictive. Many DLCs have added to the roster, so to speak. Overlord adds five new ones. You've got the new hive mind, diggy hole dwarves, guys who own a really big slingshot, psychic chosen ones, and being a subject empire from the start. An origin that brings the game ever closer to its goal of allowing players to emulate the plot of Dune. Other examples more generally include predispositions towards machines, more than one sentient starting species, being the remnant of a clone army, starting on a post-apocalypse world starting on a world about to experience the apocalypse. The list goes on. Contrast this with one of the points I would argue is a bit weaker, but also more drawn out. The Ascension Paths. I won't spend long here because I find it to be a bit more subjective and limited, but suffice to say there are only really three paths, and I do think their presence can feel a bit overbearing. Where origins open up a bunch of doors, ascensions can feel a bit like hallways. They are, among the rest of the game's mechanics, the only time I feel like I'm fighting against intended play in order to make my story. More than once, I've preferred to stop the robot ascension path at cyborgs because become robots feels like the incorrect path for my empire. The rest of the ascension perks are interesting and open-ended, but the paths just feel restrictive or like they too heavily force builds onto the game at the expense of narrative strength. In turn, the origins provide a balance of being a writing prompt, if we're speaking in creative writing terms, while being open enough that you can still write in distinctions. The guidance isn't so present that you're unable to imagine more than one story for a given origin. I have two or three using the tomb start, for example. I can imagine quite a few ways to take the new subterranean start, or absolutely several ways to take the new teachers of the shroud start. And speaking of different ways to imagine something, Stellaris and its approach to narrative remind me most of the principles of emergent gameplay, or more correctly, emergent narrative. This is like the peak of what procedural generation aspires to. Some other examples of this sort of thing outside the genre are Dwarf Fortress or The Sims even. If you really strip back what's happening in The Sims in particular, you realize the game has no real narrative. 
that players living out of fantasy are indeed incapable of actually doing so, and rather, they live out loose approximations and imagine the finer details. That's not to say that player imagination here is working against the mechanics, as with Animal Crossing, but that we, as players, have to do some work of fleshing out things in our heads. If someone was watching you play The Sims and you gave zero commentary or never vocalized your idea of who these people are, the viewer might not even see any real narrative threads or yearnings. It might even look outright entropic, chaotic. And Stellaris is kind of the same way. This is a sign that the guidance isn't too rigid. You may be picking sets of modifiers and tradition trees, but they don't force you into some specific set of events telling you what your empire believes and what it wants. That might appear to be a contradiction with the times the game does limit you, but again, balance is important. With no limits, your world feels nonsensical, like when CK2 let your kind character orchestrate murders with no repercussions where CK3 fleshed out narrative and dynamics by involving stress. I will note, however, when the game first launched, there were a few events that felt contradictory. As the game has developed more though, they've managed to give a tone to the ethics of the empires more, include more unique responses and limitations based on the empire's ethos. I do miss the era when there was only one response to your leaders getting a new trait, good or bad. It had some funny moments. Another element that uses general entropy to create a dynamic narrative is the tech system, which I brought up before in the Fukuyama video. It means the player cannot beeline certain tech, which is interesting in itself, but it also brushes away needing to adhere to a very strict tech advancement pattern. Yes, certain things are preceded by others, but the paths, in so much as there are any, far outnumber Civ's trees branches, which cap out around three at once. The game is like a writer's toolbox and does a decent job of hitting the balance of providing structure and the elements of a universe without just handing you an immutable story. It allows for narratives to emerge. Stellaris, especially when further fleshed out by expansions like Overlord, is a game that manages to hand its players narrative tools throughout the whole of the game. While I would argue they're absolutely front-loaded, being present even before the game begins with the construction of other empires and how origins shape play, they do continue throughout. The other elements contributing to narrative, however, are common to the rest of the genre. The story of empires clashing, diplomacy, expansion, familiar things. Ultimately, Stellaris gives us a lens into how narrative works within the genre when decoupled from history, from a narrative and tools we already know, or can expect to be deployed a certain way. Because of this, expansions in their content ranging from new events to new origins can be simply inspired and also unpredictable. Where history games expand in ways that are often limited to adding detail to a country or culture's depiction, Stellaris can do almost whatever it wants. I would even go so far as to say that there are certain applicable lessons to learn from the game and that we might be heading for a genre split of sorts, with games like Stellaris and Crusader Kings, narrative games on one end, and skill-based games like Hearts of Iron on the other. At the very least, they form a spectrum, and that can be useful in identifying how sandboxy the game is and in what ways the player can affect the game and the world it presents. Well, I did it. I made the video even though I said I was done with Grand Strategy for a bit. It took a little longer than expected, too. To anyone new here, hi. Welcome. Uh, don't expect more Stellaris or strategy game content anytime in the immediate future. If you want more, there's a playlist I've got, but yeah. And if you like the way I do things around here in general, maybe consider subscribing. Under advising from my CIA handlers, I also have a Patreon now. Oh, also, it should be on the screen or just past, but I thought it would be cool to feature music from the Overlord expansion in this video, so that's where it's all from. If you don't know Stellaris before this video, most of the music is adjacent to that. It's pretty good and fits the vibe of the game, I'd say. Thanks to the people who've been watching and subscribing lately. I'm surprised to see the channel growing so consistently and stuff. Uh, that's all. Maybe next time will be something really different.